It's the book club for kids. It's a book club for kids. It's the book club for kids. It's the book club for kids podcast. Hi, I'm Kitty Feldy. Do you love a mystery? Do you love playing detective, looking for clues on every page? I like puzzle books because it's like you got to put the pieces together because like they're all scattered out in the book. That's one of our readers at Washington, D.C.'s AIM Academy. The book is The Parker Inheritance by Varian Johnson. The book is about a lot of things, segregation, bullying, and most of all, a family mystery. Your grandma somehow got it in her head that there was a buried treasure hidden somewhere in the city. That's our celebrity reader, actress Sheila Collins. Our writer, Varian Johnson, says he started with an outline but ran into trouble. The Parker here is really, I really struggled with the ending of it for quite a while. And, and then one day it just kind of clicked. This is the Book Club for Kids, the podcast where kids talk about books. We'll tell you how you can be on the show a little later on. But first, let's meet our readers. Hi, my name is Mackenzie. Hi, my name is Destiny. Hi, my name is Jazeera. Um, we are 5th and 7th graders of AIM Academy in Washington, D.C. The name of the book is The Parker Inheritance. So the start of The Parker Inheritance is about Candace's grandmother was the mayor, and she found out that there was a treasure somewhere in her neighborhood, and she wanted to uncover it. But everybody thought she was crazy and thought that the treasure wasn't there. So they fired her as mayor. She had to go out of town. And she left a letter for her granddaughter, Candace, so that she can uncover the clues around town to find the treasure. Then when she goes to Lambert, back where Candace's grandmother used to work and live, she meets a boy next door named Brandon who will help her. They uncover a lot of Lambert's secrets. It's like a wild adventure, but they get through it eventually. So how would you describe this book? I would describe this book as a, like a trailblazer. When I read it, it's kind of like a presence of a graphic novel, like like there's so much action and like mystery and everything like rolled into one. I think the book has a lot of twists in it and it makes you more excited and wants you to keep reading more and more. And that's what makes books like the Park Area Heritage is so interesting because of how much tension and twists there are in the thrills in the book. Um, I think it's like a mystery and a historical book at the same time because it has the presence of bullying, it has the presence of racial discrimination, and I like the presence of the book because it gives kids like an overview of how it used to be back then. What was your favorite character in the book? Hands down, Candace. Like, she's really adventurous. She has, like, this little bike that she uses. It's really cute. And she's adventurous with Brandon. Like, she doesn't give up overall. She doesn't give up no matter what other people say. I don't really have a favorite character, but if I if I was able to choose two, it would be Candace and Brandon because... Brandon, he was one of the people that actually believed her about the treasure and wanted to help her. Um, I think my favorite character was Candace because of how outgoing she was and how brave she was to keep going on even after like people would judge her because of her grandmother or how she was still a child. She's a good representation of what kids could do at a young age, so. And she likes to help people, and also she likes to stand up for what she believes in. Well, let's hear a scene from the book where Candace learns the family secret. Our celebrity reader is actress Sheila Collins. Her mother took a deep breath, then sat down at the table. Since we're going to be living here for a while, there's a few things you need to know about your grandmother. She motioned for Candace to sit as well. Technically, Mama resigned from her job here, but she was really fired. It was a pretty big deal. She could have gone to jail. Candace's eyes widened. Her grandmother, a criminal? 
What did she do? She acted a fool, her mom muttered almost to herself. Your grandma somehow got it in her head that there was a buried treasure hidden somewhere in the city. She talked to the mayor about it. He told her to drop it. It seemed like one big con job. But I guess she didn't let it go. Mom shook her head. She spent months doing all this research about God knows what. Then she decided to dig up one of the old tennis courts, forge city paperwork to pay a crew, and rent a backhoe. Dug all night. Candace leaned forward. She pictured her grandmother with a shovel, digging up a pirate's chest full of gold. Did she find anything? Nothing but dirt, she replied. Mama was lucky. The city didn't want a scandal. They agreed not to press charges if she signed a confidentiality agreement and destroyed all her research. Candace had to sit on her hands to stop from bouncing. Lambert suddenly seemed a lot more interesting. A mystery like this was more exciting than any of the logic and strategy games on her old iPod Touch. What if Grandma was right? What if there really was a hidden fortune? I can already see the gears turning in your head, her mother said. Let me stop you now. This isn't one of your computer games. There is no buried treasure. She crossed her arms. That was what, almost 10 years ago? If there really was a pile of money hidden around the city, I'm sure someone would have found it by now. But I don't think you understand. Your grandma was the first woman and the first African-American to serve as city manager for Lambert. This was supposed to be a stepping stone to other things. Columbia, Greenville, Savannah. Who knows? Maybe she could have ended up running a big-time department for the city of Atlanta. But because she refused to let that one thing go, she torpedoed her career. And she made herself the laughingstock of the city, of the entire estate. I mean, it was all over the internet. Crazy Lady Caldwell, Alzheimer Abigail, the Mole Lady. And of course, she never got another shot at being a city manager. The excitement that had been bubbling up inside Candace began to simmer down. I never knew that. No one likes to talk about their failures, especially your grandmother. She tapped the table. I know you love a good mystery, but the last thing I need is you drumming up all this old stuff about a buried treasure. The past is the past. Mama's legacy is tarnished enough. I don't want you making it worse. Um, Talk to me a little bit about um, the segregation issue. How much of this was news to you guys? How much of this was stuff you've either learned in school or experienced? Um, We learn about segregation and social studies, and sometimes we watch documentaries or we watch movies based on things that happen in real life, and you can see how if a black man went to a white-only restaurant, they would serve him just because he was black, and... Segregation was bad because I think that nobody should be separated just because of one simple thing that separates them. And differences should keep people apart from being equal. Well, you know, there's this concept they had of separate but equal in those days. That was a way they kept people, they could enforce segregation. But when you look around at even the neighborhoods of Washington, D.C., people seem to segregate anyway. Well, yeah, um... Like, even at my own house, I don't see a single white person. It's only, like, black, black, black. And I would like to meet some other kids of, like, different backgrounds than just my own. Um, Whites don't come to Southeast because it's all black, but it's the same with us where black people don't really come to Northeast unless they really have to because it's a lot of white people there. Um, I think that... It should be easier to meet other people who are different from you because one time I was at a Girl Scouts cabin and there was a girl who was white and I became good friends with her 
but I never got to see her again because we never people um, of different races don't usually live in the same neighborhoods because of the classes that they're given by their race. Well, what can we do then? I mean, what would you do if I made you the czar of Washington, D.C.? What kinds of opportunities could we create that people could get together? What I would do is I would have equal rights for everyone. I would, first of all, I would ban guns. I would ban everything that's bad. But mostly the one thing that I don't like is that when a crime happens, they first suspect a black person for doing it. I mean, how do you fix that? How do you change people's perceptions? How do you fix this? I would put an equal amount of black and white people in charge of things so they could get along. What could you do to try to create an opportunity for people of different backgrounds to actually talk to each other, to meet each other, to be in social situations together? More events, like fun events that we can all like come together and have fun and just socialize with each other because the separation, it just leads to this hate. This also goes along with like housing and stuff. I think one of the reasons whites don't come to Southeast because the housing isn't really that great. So I think if like people like the president, people like the mayor can do something to change like how the housing is, maybe that will help the situation like a whole lot. Um, I think that most people of different races only do mostly get up for events or groups because they all support the same thing. But at the end of the day, sometimes they still don't talk to each other. They just march on. People should try join together other than events because some people don't know how to interact with others because of what they were taught as a child. We could change that by showing how we can all be together. You know, in this book, they keep referring to another book that actually we've done on book the club. Westing game? The Westing Game. Have you guys read The Westing Game? No. But here's the thing. It's a puzzle book. And do you guys like puzzle books? Because this is another one of those puzzle books. Yeah. Yeah. I like puzzle books because it's like you got to put the pieces together because, like, they're all scattered out in the book. I like the puzzle books because it's like the beginning of a book, it will be like, like this mystery and like you get deeper in the book and pages later you uncover the mystery that was at the beginning of the book and you feel very proud of yourself <laughs> yes i like puzzle books because you have to like figure out everything for yourself and if you did it and it was just all there right in front of you it would be as interested to read books like that you guys got some questions for our writer varian johnson Basically, how do you even come up with your ideas? I come up with my ideas in, in different ways. I tend to think about what I see in the world, and I think about questions, and I think about plot points of characters that probe at these same questions. You know, for the park inheritance, I was thinking a lot about what do we have to give up to be safe in the world? Um, what do we hide from other people in order to feel safe, to feel like we can be successful? Um, and, and why do we do that? Why do we have to hide pieces of ourselves? How do you come up with ideas throughout the book of how to hook a reader? That is a, a, almost an a, impossible question to answer. I think different readers gravitate to different things in books. But as far as hooking a reader, I think that depends on so many different things. I think some readers love um, a sense of setting and place you know, setting up this world before you dive into it. Some readers want to get start right off with the character. In general, I love starting kind of with a question, a mystery, kind of right in the middle of a moment. You're trying to piece it together. Like in The Parker Inheritance, it starts right when Abigail Caldwell is starting to dig up these tennis courts. And we don't have a lot of, of, of conversation before that about leading up to it. We start with that scene and then it's filled in what's going on both later on in that chapter and throughout the book. For me, I find that the most interesting, but different readers may find other things interesting. How do you come up with all the twists in the book and all of the development of building on to the end of the story? 
You know, I am a big time plotter and an outliner. I write a really big outline and I spend days, weeks, months kind of on this outline, tinkering with it until I feel it's pretty good, especially for something that's as big of a mystery as the Parker inheritance. Um, some books aren't as big or, or take as long as the outline. This one did. And then when I have a good solid outline with all the twists and turns, I start writing the book. But even then, I will often change things. I will change pieces of it, parts of the mystery to better fit the story. Or I may think of a, another twist or, or idea or aspect of the mystery that works well. All that is kind of in play once I start writing the outline. The outline kind of gives me the framework of it. But I often tell myself, well, I always tell myself that I can throw out the outline as need be and kind of go on this different path to create the story I want. I am somebody who writes a lot. Like, if I start writing a book, I would not want to finish it. So how do you come about finishing, like, the perfect finish for a book? That is hard. I think it takes a long time to come up with the perfect finish. And I think it's okay if you come up, you try and try and try and try. The Parker Inheritance really, I really struggled with the ending of it for quite a while. It had a different, it had two or three different type endings and they weren't quite fitting. They weren't quite landing. I knew that. My editor knew that. And, and then one day it just kind of clicked and I realized how I wanted it to end. And surprisingly, once I knew how I wanted the book to end, I knew how I wanted to start the book as well too. And then they both complemented each other. I, I tend to think of, of most books the beginning and the end complementing each other in some type of way, some type of kind of circular arc maybe, kind of we're ending where we started perhaps, or, or the ending is illuminating something that we saw in the beginning. All right, hard question. <laughs> What's your favorite book and why? My favorite book would be hands down The Hate You Give because it gives the essence of like how we can solve racism and it has so much drama and so much like it's so much like tension like oh what's gonna happen next oh, what's gonna happen next um my favorite book would be children of blood and bones i know it sounds scary i'm only 10 it's okay it's okay i think it's my favorite book because the boy is practicing to be a warrior, I think, to protect his tribe. No, village, village, to protect his village. And he has other warriors fighting alongside him, but they kind of leave him out. I like it because he still tries and still practices, even though they leave him out. A good book that I've read, and I think is my favorite right now, is The Long Way Down because of the click hanger at the end and how at each floor he's at um, a person comes on the elevator from his life with guns and who die from gun violence so I think that's a good book to read. Well what about you Varian Johnson? What is your favorite book? I go through stages of books that I like. I will say I was doing a lot of reading of different types of books when I was writing The Parker Inheritance. I kept coming back, back to Holes by Lewis Satcher over and over again. I kept coming back actually to uh, When You Reach Me by Rebecca Stead over and over again too. Uh, and also The Western Game by Ellen Raskin. So when I was writing that book, those three books were some of my favorites that I would constantly refer back to um, to see how authors did this or that or to just get inspiration. Now, I don't know. It, it, it just depends. I'm a huge fan of graphic novels right now. And I love everything by Raina Telgemeier, for instance. But I also love great historical fiction. I love Rita Williams Garcia's One Crazy Summer. Got a favorite book, Sheila Collins? It's called The House on Mango Street. It's written by Sandra Cisneros, and it chronicles the struggles of a young Latina immigrant who is trying to find her way in the world and trying to fit in while remaining true to herself. It's really worth a read. It is very pertinent to the issues that we all see in the headlines today, and there are some really, really valuable lessons regarding belonging and compassion and caring for others. So I recommend that book. I think you'll like it. This episode is funded in part by the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. 
dedicated to advancing the education of exceptionally promising students who have financial need. Thanks this week to producer Ilse Setziel. Jonathan Jensen composed our theme with additional music from Charles Nilman. Emma Steinkellner designed our logo. Thanks to writer Varian Johnson and our celebrity reader, Sheila Collins. And thanks as well to our readers this week, Mackenzie, Destiny, and Jasira, and their teacher at AIM Elementary, Ashley Rose. We have a free newsletter for teachers, parents, and librarians full of free tips about how to turn kids into lifelong readers. You can sign up at our website, bookclubforkids.org. And if you love mysteries, check out our other podcast, The Fina Mendoza Mysteries. It's the story of a 10-year-old daughter of a congressman who solves mysteries in the U.S. Capitol and teaches civics along the way. It's available now free wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Kitty Feldy. Thanks so much for listening. 